Temporal humans, whatever that means. This is Annabelle Lee, and I have a voice that is spooky and innocent at the same time. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 17 of the Trailer Trash Terrors Podcast. Today's episode is titled, You Know, I've Got Them Heavy Paranormal Blues. Really? That's the best you can do? Sigh. Trailer Trash Terrors temporal humans. This is Boudreaux, the striving to be empathetic, cybernetic ghost from the future. If I had legs, I would be walking down this gravel road, listening to the birds, and trying to devise a plan to help Vic Hermanson. You see, the trailer Trash Terrors founder, has a bad case of burnout, and probably, the heavy paranormal blues. Intervention may be needed. Show's called Trailer Trash Terrace, and it's usually cool. But don't you know lately, Dicker Manson feels like a fool. I've got those heavy, 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 heavy paranormal blues. Yeah, it ain't no lie. I got them heavy, stinking paranormal blues. Hi everybody, this is Vic Hermanson, and Boudreaux is 100% correct. I do have the paranormal blues. I'm at least temporarily burned out. That's one thing you don't hear talked about much in the paranormal community. These topics are heavy. I mean, we're talking about lives that have been impacted by difficult to understand, frightening, perhaps even dangerous things. We're talking about human souls who, for some reason, have decided that they want to stick around on the earthly plane. We're talking about monsters. We're talking about monsters of the perhaps fictional variety, and we're certainly talking about monsters of the clearly non-fictional human variety. It gets heavy. It can wear one down. And I decided I just needed a break from some of that heaviness. So I decided that this episode should be a little different. First, nothing deep, nothing heavy, nothing tragic. Second off, a shorter show, probably about half an hour. I want generally these episodes to be about an hour long, but for a week when I'm trying to rest and recoup, Probably half an hour is a better idea. This last weekend, I conducted two of the most amazing interviews I've ever done. When I say amazing, they felt amazing to me. They were very powerful. They affected my psyche. They affected my soul. And I'll be putting together probably four episodes from those two interviews. And I think you are going to enjoy those a great deal. One is about a lady who claims to be, and I believe is, a psychic. It was one of the more astounding interviews I've ever had. The other is talking about the Catholic Church and the changes and issues it's experiencing. It's also pretty astounding. But for this week... All I'm going to do is I'm going to read from some of the fun stuff from Fortean Times. That's F-O-R-T-E-A-N Times. It's a British magazine talking about Fortean events all over the world. A Fortean event is something that is mysterious, but might be 
explainable through normal physics and physical causality. It's kind of a, a state between skepticism and credulity. The skeptic absolutely denounces everything. The credulous behave as if everything they ever impact is real. Fordians stay somewhere in the middle. And the truth is, that's the place where there's the most fun. I don't have to reject anything out of hand, and I don't have to accept anything without adequate evidence. But man, just like you, just like many of my friends, I find these instances, these events, these stories so incredibly interesting. And I want to hear the stories. You know, that's the new motto of Trailer Trash Terrors. We are made of stories. I have really fallen in love with that motto. Because we are. We build our lives around the stories that we use to define ourselves. Let me bring a few bits of Fordian wisdom to the Trailer Trash Terrors podcast. Amazing and astounding 14 times tidbit number one. Where is Steve McQueen when you need him? Here's another previously unpublished report, which is long overdue, for entrance into Fortean literature. As the more astute among you may have guessed by the title, it concerns the sighting of, what else? A blob. In September of 1969, a young Nebraska City, Nebraska man, Maurice Colbert and his girlfriend were parked along a lover's lane area north of Nebraska City, near the banks of the Missouri River. The young lady began to complain that she was hearing strange noises outside of the car. After a good deal of prodding, Maurice was finally persuaded that she was serious, and after listening, realized that there were some strange slurping noises coming from outside. Maurice left the car, and seeing nothing initially, moved towards the rear of the vehicle, where the sounds became louder. Describing the night as a very bright, moonlit evening, Maurice was able to see what he described as an amoeba-shaped blob, about six feet across, and about 18 inches thick, moving along the ground. He indicated the blob would move much as an amoeba by extending a gelatinous pseudopod and then pulling itself along in that direction, or rather flowing into itself. After watching the blob for about two minutes, it had moved six to eight feet closer to the car. Maurice indicated that the purplish-pink thing had no discernible odor and seemed to have no awareness of his presence. Later examination of the site showed a sort of trail which had apparently been pushed clear of small sticks, pebbles, and other debris as the creature flowed along the ground. Due to the highly unusual nature of this event, I am unable even to speculate as to a normal explanation for the event. I would be very interested in hearing from many other researchers who may be aware of similar incidents. The only possibility I'm aware of would be the appearance of a giant slime mold. But six feet across? All comments on this one are welcome. Amazing and astounding 14 times tidbit number two. Winged Wonder Over Falls City. A fascinating account of a winged weirdy was given to me several months ago by the witness to the event. The name of the witness is on file and available to serious researchers. We will refer to the gentleman as Mr. Hanks because of his request for anonymity. On a beautiful autumn afternoon in 1956, Hanks and his family were returning home from an outing. The family had unloaded their car and gone into the house while Hanks readied some equipment he needed at work in his pickup truck. As he was going about this, he noticed what at first he thought was a kite about three blocks away from his home. As he watched, the kite drew closer and Hanks assumed that it had gotten away from whomever was flying it. As this object fluttered to within about a block of his position, Hanks realized that it was not a kite but a human-like form with wings. As the thing came closer, Hanks was able to see the creature's face, which he described as very frightening, almost demonic. 
Its eyes were very large, blue in color, and watery. They were shaped and placed on his face almost like horse's eyes. The skin on his face was like tan leather. It was very wrinkled and seemed to overlap in folds. I had a good look at his face, as it was only about 25 feet away and hovering, maybe 15 feet above the ground. He was between 8 and 9 feet tall. As Hanks watched, the creature wobbled and almost fell to the street below. After recovering, the creature flew toward Hanks and passed directly overhead. Interestingly, as Hanks watched the creature approaching closer, he tried to move and found he couldn't. He was experiencing some sort of paralysis. As the creature passed overhead, Hanks was able to observe the wings of the thing. He described them as like polished aluminum with a grid-like appearance on the top side. The underside of the wings each had four or five colored lights about four inches in diameter the lights closest to his body on either side glowed blue, then a yellow, then an orange, and finally red light out toward each wingtip. The wing was at least 15 feet long from tip to tip, according to Hanks. He indicated that the wings appeared to be about two feet wide next to the creature's body and three feet wide at the tip. When asked how the wing was attached, Hanks said that it was fastened to him by a shoulder harness, which seemed to have a breastplate of some sort, with dials on it. He seemed to touch and move these dials, but his hands, if that's what they were, looked more like white dove wings all opened up. Hanks went on to say that as the creature passed overhead, he heard a sound like air hissing from what he thought was the rear of the wing. As he watched, the creature moved off into the distance and disappeared behind a group of trees about two blocks away. After the creature was out of sight, Hanks was able to move again. He said that the entire event lasted somewhere around eight to 10 minutes. According to Hanks, for the next 23 years, he was continually bothered by nightmares in which the creature would reappear. He became, in his own words, a workaholic. I wouldn't sleep more than I absolutely had to, and I worked constantly, so I wouldn't have time to think about it. Finally, over a period of three years, Hanks was able to overcome this obsession by forcing himself to write out the story and then destroy it. Evidently, this served as a suitable catharsis because Hanks concluded by saying, I still don't understand it, but it doesn't matter anymore. Amazing and astounding 14 times tidbit number three. What is a Milo Man? We are currently trying to track down further verification of sightings of a bipedal humanoid creature, which has been dubbed Milo Man. Reports of this rather strangely named creature have been surfacing infrequently for about six months. The alleged creature has gained its name from the locale where the witnesses believe it lives, namely a Milo field. The most coherent and credible account to date involves a young man who had driven out to his brother's rural Lincoln, Nebraska home to spend the night, only to find his brother was away and the house locked. Having no other choice, he decided to sleep in the back seat of his car. Sometime during the night, he was awakened by the car being violently shaken around. Thinking at first it was his brother who had returned, he sat up and looked out the back window. He observed a much larger than human form, which was standing near the rear of the car and shaking it back and forth. Not knowing what else to do, he hid on the floor of the car until this large hair-covered figure, tired of its car shaking, and wandered off. The next morning on the brother's return, he related his experience, and was told that several farmers in the area had also seen this creature and had dubbed it Milo Man. The above outline event occurred in late September 1985, and we are currently following further leads to try and establish additional sightings and further corroboration. We'll have more on this as we uncover it. Well, see, we got the terrorizing or the terrifying piano keys there. 
So, the Trailer Trash Terrors moniker has not been betrayed. Actually, those three stories came from the Journal of the Fortean Research Center that was founded in Nebraska in 1982. Those three stories represent about 95% of everything published in that very first issue. For the rest of the show, I'm going to move away from the paranormal. I'm going to move away from the terrifying. I'm going to try to delve into what I hope is poignant. It's a story about a young man named Vic Hermanson who grew up in Tampa, Florida and met a girl that he fell in love with. Wow, that's unique, isn't it? He also had a very fine teacher named John Bowen. And here is that story. I've been told that it reads like something written by Earl Hamner. I hope you enjoy it. And I hope you forgive me for the strangeness of this episode. It's what happens when someone is mentally exhausted, but still feels the incredible need to publish an episode. The name of this memory essay is Confidence, A Girl with Soft Eyes and the Teaching Genius. I went to T.R. Robinson High School in Tampa, Florida. It's still there. One of the required courses was essentially civics, but was given the course name Problems in American Democracy. The title made my father livid. He was convinced we were studying straight from Das Kapital or the Communist Manifesto. Actually, it was a very good course with an excellent textbook that based all lessons on original source documents. I had requested to be in Mr. Bowen's class. He was brilliant, demanding, and greatly overqualified with dual PhDs in history and political science. He had planned a career in government. He was notorious for being the most unforgiving grader in the school. The title of the course referred to the tools the American form of democracy provides in facing societal issues, as well as the strengths and limitations of those tools. During this time, I had taken notice of a girl who sat behind me in several classes. She had a particular combination of facial features, intelligence, vocal inflection, gentle humor, elegant hands, and an engaging smile that to me was utterly irresistible. I loved to watch her talk, to think, to laugh. The degree to which I was smitten must have been painfully obvious to anyone who cared to observe. I found every aspect of her wondrous and fascinating. Her name was Sharon. Somehow, it was a perfect name for her. One weekend, I spent every available minute writing and rewriting a letter confessing my love to her. It was the most careful and deliberate thing I had ever written. I only knew the name of the street she lived on and not her actual address. So I rode my battered Schwinn varsity across the Tampa Peninsula to her street and watched the various houses while riding casually through the neighborhood. Finally, I saw her walk to the mailbox, barefoot and wearing shorts and a yellow blouse. She didn't see me. But now I had the address. Envelope. Check. Proper address. Check. Legible. Check. Letter and envelope. Double check. The mailbox in my yard would not do. Not at all. So the varsity and I took the trip to the Gandhi post office. I stood in front of the stainless steel drop-off door for several minutes, sweating, trembling, mildly nauseated. Then, with one quick motion, it was in the mail. No turning back through the force of the federal law of the United States of America. I rode home slowly through many back streets, with small 
Latin-inspired houses in Spanish moss. Noticing the concrete, stained all rust from artesian wells, I was monitoring myself, seeing if any tinge of regret built up. In my brain, in my mind, it never did. I was happy and peaceful and felt a small burgeoning of self-determination. Back at school, Mr. Bowen was bearing down hard on his supposedly elite students. He told us that the most critical assignment of the course was coming up. He would develop five unique questions, questions that changed every year. We were to answer them in essay form, taking on the voice of Publius, referencing the Federalist Papers, and adding our own thought and analysis. The assignment was legendary in the school, as difficult to pass and impossible to excel at. We had one weekend to write our five 1,000-word essays. The very idea of the assignment made me both excited and very frightened. I had never had a teacher I wanted to please more than Mr. Bowen. The Friday before the weekend of the essay gauntlet, in Doc Howe's chem study class, Sharon walked up behind me and gave me a small blue envelope. The only address was Victor, written in a perfect feminine hand. I only had a moment to observe, but her lips trembled and her eyes were flashing. Then she was gone. I read the letter sitting on the cool terrazzo floor outside Mr. Bowen's classroom. I felt comfortable there. The response was all that a bookish and shy boy from a dysfunctional, often abusive home could ever hope for. In fact, it was far more than he could ever hope for. Almost instantly, as through some hidden alchemy of spirit, I was a different person. I went to the library and found the Q team practicing. Broxmeyer, Armstrong, Turley, Klein, Hewitt, the academic lions of our school, the full ride to Yale or Stanford kids. They rarely tolerated any intrusion from the likes of me into their cerebral realm. They started to put me through the gauntlet, but the gauntlet was no challenge. I had greater specific knowledge than most of them and greater broad-based knowledge than all of them. My conceptual manipulation ability was lightning fast. After about 15 minutes, Klein said, Are you really Victor? Why aren't you on the team? I shrugged, wished them well, and left. When I got home, the neighborhood kids were playing street football. It was a great game. We might have four kids, or we might have 12 kids, but the rules were the same. Two-hand touch, play pauses when a car shows up, no tripping, and the goal lines were Ricky's mailbox and the manhole cover in front of Joey's house. Every street in Tampa seemed to have kids playing the same game. It was Ricky's football, so he was the quarterback. Hey, Hermanson. We always called each other by our last names. Listen, man, do one of those long, curly post patterns, and I'll hit you in the flat. I had no idea what all that meant, but I said... You've got it, Rick. I lined up across from Gary David Maxwell, the best athlete in the neighborhood, an arrogant bully, and later convicted rapist. Upon hearing Ricky's hut, I ran directly at Gary, never losing eye contact, fainted to the right, then bolted to the left. It was an ankle-breaking move. Gary screamed something like, No fair! And Ricky indeed hit me in the flat. I wasn't a bad athlete, but I had never done anything like that before. Past Ricky's mailbox, I stopped running, turned to look to the west and saw Phil Tyler's huge silhouette, pumping his fist in the air, shouting, Woo! 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 I just remember smiling, feeling peaceful, watching Phil against the reddening sunset, and jogging home loving every footfall and celebrating every muscle contraction. 
Most Friday evenings, my dad would come home drunk, carrying a case of Pabst Blue Ribbon. That was the case this evening also. Dad was a mean and aggressive drunk, and once inebriation was established, his main goal was to detect some slight, some faux pas, some oversight, just anything to justify the initial attack. After that, no justification was needed, and the home would become something akin to a psychological and sometimes physical torture chamber, often until he passed out. I developed, over the years, all manner of skills in predicting and occasionally preventing this behavior. But this night, of course, I could do anything, anything at all. After all, I was a different person. When I heard Dad's truck in the driveway, I looked out the window and saw the opened blue box of beer. That was my cue to think fast. Mom was cooking something, so that hazard was probably covered. Now, how to keep his attention? How to keep the anger from erupting? The thought arose that any action was better than no action. I was fully willing to lie to avoid my mother trembling in fear and the house having the psychic feel of the inside of a vengeful insect's brain. Ego. Pride. Nostalgia. How could I combine and exploit those things? Acting mostly on instinct, I ran to his room and found his coroner slide rule in its leather case. It was made of bamboo, and it was a wonderful, warm, and elegant thing to hold in one's hand. Dad had told me it was lubricated with whale oil, which he said should last several lifetimes. I ambushed him and turned on the boyish charm, at least what I had. Dad, I've got a big chemistry test on Monday, and Doc Howe said we could use a calculator or a slide rule. We don't have a calculator, but Mom said you were the best at using slide rules in college. She had never mentioned slide rules at all. Please, Dad, teach me how to use it. All this was said with as much enthusiasm as I could muster. I knew something about the slide rule, logarithms, decimal translations, and other such terms, so I peppered the conversation with those phrases. The look on his face was different. I could tell he expected, perhaps even wanted, to swim in the anger. But I caught his attention. Mom had dinner ready about then, and by never shutting up about math, molarity, and calculating drilling parameters, I kept his attention. He was too drunk to teach the slide rule, but he told stories of being in college, gas wells, and oil derricks. And at least that one Friday night, we avoided the horror. He forgot about the slide rule, but the weekend was full of football, and the house was quiet and peaceful. Crisis averted, at least this one time, I set about becoming the modern voice of Publius. Remember Publius and Mr. Bowen? They're still a part of this story. I didn't have a desk, and I didn't want to work on the kitchen table. I wanted to be alone with my five essays, the Federalist Papers, my confidence, and, of course, Sharon's letter. I ensconced myself in the room I shared with my brother and quickly entered John Nash territory. We had a big pine board and I used it to organize ideas, snippets of paper, and full paragraphs. I would read Publius, think about an essay question, write with a fevered mind, reorganize my board, and read Sharon's letter. Every bit of work was interspersed with reading her letter. I probably read it 120 times that weekend. By Sunday afternoon, the room was a monumental, beatific mess, piled high with papers and discarded ideas, food crumbs scattered about, you know, chaos. But the essays were on that board, scraps of paper coming together in five distinct, carefully considered, joyously written gestaltic themes. 
one by one. I wrote them out in ink with my best handwriting. Every few paragraphs, I would stop and read Sharon's letter. The mess in the room made me feel unreasonably happy, and my brother didn't seem to mind. For Monday, I had two goals: turn in my essays to Mr. Bowen and learn more about Sharon. I put my assignment in a Manila envelope and made sure I was the last one in line. He never called me Victor. I was either Hermanson or Merriam-Webster. So, Hermanson, do you have good stuff here? Any superlative insights? I so deeply wanted to have a pithy quote from Madison or Hamilton, but all I could really say was, rather meekly, I worked really hard on them. I did my best. The man didn't really have a smile. He had a scowl, in which his lips strove. To curve upward, I knew that was the best I would get, and it was more than enough. Sharon was in my next class. I was excited, nervous, scared. Crap, I was terrified. But in that cauldron of emotions, I was beatifically happy. The problem was, I had no idea how to be a boyfriend. Be nice to her. Yeah, that's easy. Make her laugh? That had always been a natural thing. Now I was thinking about it, but I kept at it, and about three days later, we seemed like a high school couple. My friends and her friends thought of us as such. There was a fifties dance coming up, and we planned to go together. I was still clueless about this whole boyfriend thing. On Friday morning, Mr. Bowen asked me to come to his office at lunch. I told him I would, and suddenly I had something to talk about with Sharon. She squeezed my hand and said, "Don't worry, he likes you." That was the first affection I had ever received from a romantic partner. Meeting at lunch was no problem. I was too nervous to eat, and they were serving that horrible school spaghetti. It tasted like paste with diluted tomato sauce. Mmm, yum! I knocked on his door, and he opened it immediately. The scowl with the curling lips was on his face. Sit down, Hermanson. I have something for you. My Manila envelope was on his desk, with a folded piece of paper taped to it. He nodded, indicating I should read it. Trembling, I picked it up, unfolded it. And began to read. I've lost the letter. I can't see it in my mind, but I can paraphrase with some degree of accuracy. Dear Victor, it can be hard being a teacher. There are so many minds put before me, and I can only touch a few. But I want you to know that I have found reading your essays extraordinary. I've taught this class for twelve years. And in all that time, this is the best assignment response I have ever received. You should be proud of it. If you need a college recommendation from me, I'll make it a good one. Sincerely, John Bowen. I teared up a bit. That's what I do. Next, I remember his deep, gravelly voice asking, "Where did this come from?" Yeah, you've done decent work. But I can tell that you coast sometimes. This is a different category of work entirely. Why haven't I seen this all year? When does a man or a boy decide to be fully open and honest? I hadn't told my mom or my dad about Sharon. My friends knew, but they didn't know the inner me. Somehow, Mr. Bowen did. Well, Mr. Bowen. Since last Friday, I've felt like a different person, a, a better person. Here's why. I handed him the letter, and in the thirty seconds it took him to read it, I saw myriad computations and assessments move across his face. The scowl lessened. He folded the letter and gave it back to me gently, almost reverently. He had. Bushy eyebrows, 
and intense gray eyes. Do you think this letter gave you the ability to think and write like this? Stammering, I responded softly. It feels that way. He thought for what seemed like a long time. When he spoke, he sounded more like a friend than a teacher. Yeah, it gave you something. It gave you confidence and set your brain on fire. But that ability was always in there. Do me a favor and believe that. Now, you better get some food and find that girl. I had more classes with Mr. Bowen. And in every single one, I used my pine board and gave him the best I had in me. Sharon and I, as a couple, lasted about three weeks. We went to a dance. Her friends appraised me, as girls' friends do, and found me seriously wanting. We took a long walk along Bayshore Boulevard, laughing at the stink of the artesian wells, and talked with a fair degree of comfort. I could make her laugh again. When she laughed, she would tilt her head down to the left and smile. I found that movement profoundly beautiful. We shared a half dozen dances, twice as many electric gazes, a few pizzas, the gentle trembling touch of each other's hands, six or so quick tentative kisses, and exactly one softer, unhurried, lingering kiss. I can still see the way she opened her arms to accept me next to her when I asked her to dance to a slow song. She was wearing a poodle skirt and those goofy black and white shoes. It was Tampa, and that means it was hot. I remember inhaling the aroma of the sweat on her neck as we danced and feeling that nothing in life could be better. We ended as a couple soon after that. That hurt. A lot. For a long time. But I've always felt deeply grateful for her presence in my life. She allowed me to feel confidence and belief in myself as I never had before. She allowed me to learn with complete innocence how wonderful it can be to hold a woman you love. She taught me at least some of the excruciating and exquisite joy and pain of loving a woman. She also allowed me to gain Mr. Bowen as an understanding friend and a dedicated mentor. I still remember Mr. Bowen. I still remember Sharon. I still remember the aroma of her sweat and perfume as we danced. I still remember how she trembled when I kissed her neck without even thinking about it. Publius is still on the shelf, and with great frequency, I thank God for giving me the chance to live through these memories. Thank you for listening to Trailer Trash Terrors. This podcast is written and produced by me, Vic Hermanson. All media clips are used under the protection of the Fair Use Doctrine. The music you heard was provided by Lobo Loco and Smart Sound. If you have anything good or bad, indifferent, scathing, praising to say about the show, please write to us at Trailer Trash Terrors at gmail.com I think this week I'm going to keep it really really simple and instead of Lobo Loco music going out I'm going to play some instances of the show's new motto that motto being we are made of stories 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 We are made of stories. 
We are made of stories. We are made of stories. We are made of stories. We are made of stories. In my mind, we really are made of stories. Every bit as much as we are made of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and calcium and blood and sweat and bone and mind and brain. We are made of stories. Talk to you next week.